if both labs pick up the same signal, chances are it's not noise from Earth, but a gravitational wave from space. And that was our video about Project LIGO looking for gravity waves. Now, Brian, it looks like the facility is already built. Is it operational, and has it actually detected any gravity waves yet? Marty, we've had a facility for many years now, and initial LIGO ran for two years and then had an upgrade that ran for another year. And in those three years of collecting data, we have not yet seen any gravitational waves. This is not so surprising. We probably wouldn't have expected to see any with the initial detector. And that's why we're now <clears throat> making a serious upgrade to that detector, which will be complete in about 2014. And that should allow us to measure about a thousand times more volume of space, which ought to make our event rate uh, very exciting. When you say you're measuring a bigger <clears throat> volume of space, is that what you're looking for? I thought the waves were just coming in all the time. They are coming in all the time, but there's a certain amount of signal that we can actually see. The new detector, the advanced LIGO detector, will be about 10 times more sensitive, which means you can see about 10 times farther out into space. So if you can see about 10 times farther out, you can see about 1,000 times more volume of space. So there ought to be about 1,000 times more things causing gravitational waves. Now, electromagnetic <laughs> waves have a frequency and an amplitude. Is that true of gravitational waves also? Like how many times an, an hour would you expect to see the tubes oscillate back and forth? Would it be 1,000 times an hour or you know, once in 10 years? We don't know yet. No one's ever measured a gravitational wave. And so the exact what we call the event rate is not, not yet known. We're expecting, based on models that the theorists have uh, developed, that we'll see anywhere from maybe 10 events to maybe as many as 100 events per year. The kinds of things that LIGO is most sensitive to are the final collisions of black holes when they collide, or neutron stars when they collide, or supernovas when they explode. Um, there is a class of events where there's a single source that gives a long, steady uh, signal. And and those we should be able to see all the time. But these big events um, are going to be a strong function of, of how often they occur in the universe, which is something that we don't know yet. Well, Ricardo, what's the <clears throat> biggest technological challenge of building this type of detector? What are the problems that have to be solved? Well, the, the biggest problem with these detectors is that gravitational, the gravitational wave signals that we're expecting to see are very, very small. So they are... The types of strains that we expect to get gravitational waves from are 10 to the minus 18 meters. So in order to measure that tiny displacement, which is many orders of magnitude less than the size of a single atom, uh, we have to develop the most sensitive displacement measurement instruments that have ever been developed. So that brings with it a whole host of technological challenges, which all the scientists around the world that are working in the LIGO scientific collaboration have had to develop new technologies which allow us to really cancel out all sources of noise as much as possible within the detectors and just leave enough of the universe visible so that we can get these detection rates. So when Brian was talking about getting uh, so many events a year in advanced LIGO giving us a thousand times more volume, the reason that's happening is because between initial LIGO and advanced LIGO, technologies have developed such that the, um, the sensitivity has increased so the noise floor has been reduced. We've increased our, uh, we've developed new technologies, and with that uh, increase in sensitivity, the volume of the universe, which we're visible to gravitational waves from, is increased. Anything beyond that, and it basically becomes a little bit like noise in the background. Because you have a resolve. problem with interference, any vibration, a truck passing by ten miles away, maybe. But I understand mm -hmm. that you brought some of your technology into the studio, and you're going to show us how some of it works. It's over that on that table. Brian, maybe you could uh, bring some of that over. And uh... I brought a few of the toys from the lab over. One of the things that I work on at Stanford is building very quiet tables that you can put the optics on. And one of the ways that we do that is we have tables that are about the size of this table. And we put very sensitive vibration sensors on there. This is a, actually a commercial uh, instrument. It's called a geophone. And it can measure how much the ground is moving. Or if you mount it on the table, it can measure how much the, the table is moving by watching 
the middle of the instrument move up and down with respect to the table. If you put a couple of these on your table and you hook it up to a big computer control system, when the table starts to move, you can actively hold the table very, very still. Is that all software <coughs> controlled or is it basically a mechanical device like we, a, we use, a shock absorber? Yeah, we use all the tricks we can, Marty. We have both uh, very good what we call passive isolation, which is just the mechanical system, the table, hanging on springs, trying to be quiet all by itself. And we have what we call active control, where we monitor what the inertial sensors are doing, and we use computer feedback control to help make the table even quieter. Now, I understand in that uh, LIGO facility, those tubes were about four kilometers long, I think. So is this what's going to keep it steady, something like this? Those, those tubes have a bunch of optical tables in them, and those tables each have optics hanging from the tables. Mm -hmm. And most of those tubes are filled with vacuum. And we just measure the distance from one mirror down to the other. And those tables all have sensors like this built into them. They all have fancy uh, mirrors hanging off. I brought a model of one of the mirrors, too. Oh, well, let's take a look. Yeah, this is a... Um, Be nice not, in a discotheque. That's right. A, uh, this is the model of the mirrors that I use when we're uh, talking to high school students. And the, the way that the uh, <clears throat> real mirrors look, obviously, is not uh, quite like a disco ball. But it, this is a nice demonstration because it shows how we can help keep the mirrors quiet at the high frequencies where we're looking for the gravitational waves. You can see that my, uh, my LIGO mirror here is hanging from a rubber band. And the reason that you do that is because when you, when you shake the, the ground very very quickly, as you can see my hand is shaking, you can see that my hand is shaking much more than the, than the mirror is. And so we can hold these mirrors um, to be almost uh, 10 to the 7 times more quiet than the table they're sitting on, which is about a thousand times more quiet than the ground. So the, mirror, the motion of the mirror above about 10 hertz is almost uh, 10 billion times less than the ground is shaking. And that very quiet mirror allows you to, to look for the distance between it and the other mirror. And if you see that the distance between the mirrors is suddenly changing, but the mirrors themselves aren't moving, then it must be the passive passage of a gravitational wave. I think you have some additional optics over there as yeah. well. That's right. Now, Ricardo has asked me not to touch the, uh, to touch the optics, but... Um, Is that visible? The, Is there any <clears throat> light on that? I think the camera might be able to see the, the initial uh, test piece of sapphire here. Ricardo, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, no problem. So these are just some test optics. So they're not even to scale. The LIGO optics are pretty big compared to these. But the largest optic that you can see there is just a pure sapphire mass. So uh, the purest form of sapphire that we can manufacture. So that must be pretty expensive, I would think. It is. I mean, just that test mass alone is around $40,000. Oh. So it's, uh, these are very pure materials. And to get the purity that we need uh, to avoid any sources of noise, we need the best quality. So sapphire was a good candidate. But actually, what's used in LIGO is, is, is very pure silica. So it's silica glass, uh, they call it ultra pure fused silica. Uh, so these other optics you can see here, which actually have a coating on them as well. There's a smaller optic over there. Uh, and uh, the coating there is basically uh, one of the test mirror coatings, which is designed to give maximum reflectivity. So you have your mirror coating. You don't want the laser beam to be absorbed. You want it to bounce back from the surface. You don't want it to penetrate a little bit. So that. It almost seems to get into nanotechnology. We're yeah. probably talking about things that are a few atoms thick. Yeah. Well, these are, I mean, the coatings themselves, uh, they, they're designed in such a way that it reduces the amount of optical absorption. So the light that's hitting it from the laser, we want to lose as little as possible. Uh, and then to get the highest reflectivity possible, we have stacks of these uh, 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 mirror layers, which give us a... Uh, uh, the maximum reflectivity possible. So it's not really a nanoscale technology, but it really is the cutting edge of what optics can give us. Now, the, the flatness of those optics is at the atomic, at the atomic la level, but the thickness of them is, is many, many, many atoms thick. Now let's say you're able to find actual gravity waves. How will that help us? 